Hi everyone, I'm Paul McVeigh and these days I'm a keynote speaker and welcome to episode 16 of McVeigh Meets. I'm delighted you could be joining us today. Um, if you watched me yesterday, you would have seen me speaking with two-time world he not heavyweight, bloody, amazing boxer Carl Frampton and he was fascinating listening to his story. What an amazing career he's had so far. So even though this is the 16th interview in just over a week, if you are joining us for the first time, I've been doing a series of interviews with some of the most successful people I know from the worlds of business, media, arts, TV, entrepreneurship and sport. Unfortunately, none of those were available, so I had to call on two teammates instead. So please welcome <laughs> Premier League footballer and now Catholic priest, Father Philip Moran, and a man who needs no introduction, so I'm not going to give him one, Jim Magilton. <laughs> <laughs> Lads, you how, <laughs> how's it going? How's it going today? Uh, dead on. Actually, uh, my life as a professional footballer has taught me self-isolation as part and parcel of it. So uh, pretty accustomed to being on my own. Really no mates. So uh, no, it's been tough for everyone, but okay. Okay, I'm still here. Still going through it. And we should just introduce... Phil Moran. Phil, you're obviously sitting there in your in your robes these days that you were as a Catholic priest. But I'm guessing as in lockdown, there's probably not much difference for your life these days, is it? Mm. Yeah, the the life inside the, the monastery is pretty much the same, obviously, you know, but the big difference is that the church the church is closed and so the the people aren't there, you know. So even when you're saying like we're saying mass at the minute and live streaming it over the internet every day at eleven o'clock. So even when you're up there preaching or doing something, you're preaching into a camera, you know, the people aren't there, you know, so that's the, the biggest difference is the church isn't open. So, but inside everything's, everything's the same. Yeah. And, and interesting. And of course, we're going to come back to obviously what you're doing these days, but the fact that I've got both of you on, on the, this is the first time we're doing a double act lad. So I have no idea what's going to happen here. This, this could be chaos. <laughs> so I suppose the best way to do this is just to set the scene for anybody who's tuning in. You know, because this is going live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. So people are probably watching this all over the world because I've had messages from different different parts of the world about the interviews. Let's take it back all the way to the very, very start. Three of us growing up in West Belfast. Jim, you were slightly older than us and growing up in the 70s. Phil and myself growing up in the 80s. So let's start with you, Jim. You had obviously growing up in a place and a time that was in a really, really troubled period of Belfast. So what was that like for you? Considering I'm guessing all you wanted to do was play football. And that's basically all I did. And playing football was just part of it. It's, my earliest childhood memories has always been around football or another type of ball. And uh, and you know what? I had, I had fantastic support, family support, great friends. Kids were always out in the street. Listen, we were basically growing up in a war zone. And that's not, and that's putting it mildly. But do you know what? Happiest times of my life. Loved it. Uh, constantly out in the street, constantly practicing with the ball. Uh, mom, dad, working class family. Uh, just a real fun time. Honestly, really, really fun time. L lived next door to the school. Was in the school first thing in the morning. Caretaker used to let me in with my ball. Used to practice, practice, practice. After school, then went to a grammar school. And uh, and just, deal, just dealt in sport all my life. Just absolutely loved it. So... Uh, fully aware of what was going on around me, um, fully aware of the, the extent of the situation growing up in Northern Ireland at the time, uh, but really lots of childhood memories were all fun, all sport, and just a really enjoyable time. Okay, fantastic. Well, that's, that's a good good introduction into it, and uh, the fact that I've got my little Snellover Plunkett top on here, team we all played for, so Phil... Give us, give us your take on obviously growing up. We were mm. same age growing up, went to opposite schools, but played in loads of same teams all the way through before we both left at 16. What was your kind of version of growing up? Yeah, I would say, reiterate what Jim's saying there in the sense of like, when you look back at it now, you really do look back at it as a really, one of the best uh, periods of your life, you know, despite the fact of what, what all was going on around you. Um, and I think the scary bit about it really is when you look back at it, when you were living through that, how, how normal you felt it was. And that's the scary part of something, a situation like that. It becomes 
your normal way of existing, you know, and you don't know anything different. And so you get on with things. You're out in the streets all day with your mates and like Jim there, you know, playing football until t until the sun went down, you know, my mum calling me in. And and um, I suppose what football gave us, I, I don't know about yourself, but like when we, especially when we started playing for Northern Ireland, especially that was my first real contact with like, say, Pro the Protestant community, like fellas from different areas in Northern Ireland that I'd never came across before. And then giving you the opportunity to go abroad and, and play for Northern Ireland abroad and then sort of opens your mind a little bit and you realize, God, this isn't this isn't really normal what we're living through here, you know. Um, but at the same time, I had a, a, a very happy upbringing, a wonderful family as well. Three older sisters, my, my parents, uh, great values. And then obviously, as we'll talk about in a minute, the, the foundation that uh, St. Oliver Plunkett gave each one of us, like a, a community within a community, really like an, an extra family. Uh, it was amazing, really. Well, well, let's touch on that because, as you say, you know, all of us uh, were really, really fortunate to be around a man mm -hmm. and Jackie Maxwell, who started us and Oliver Plunkett in the seventies. But Jim, you probably knew him. I'm guessing better than all of us because obviously you knew him for longer and, and you met him earlier. So, so what do you think? was the reason why St. Oliver Plunkett went on to have such a huge impact on so many kids' lives across Belfast? Well, my, par my parents knew Jackie first, and Jackie was always in the house. He used to come in the house to visit my dad and my mom, and, uh, and Jackie went through horrendous personal loss, and St. Oliver Plunkett became his life, and it was his lifelong ambition to make sure that kids got off the street and actually were just playing sport. There was no ambition for any young player to go on and be what we eventually became. If you look at the area and you look at the, the players that have produced, uh, the club have produced, and in particular, his huge influence on me, on you, on Philly, on Anton, on on Mal to a lesser extent, you look at that small enclave of, of West Belfast and the amount of international footballers, it's, in, it's incredible. But again, it was just part of that community it was part of a, a a club that had the best interests of young people it wasn't about producing footballers it was just young people giving them an enjoyable time and again as philly had pointed out through horrendous times we were traveling all over belfast we were going to Molusk and his green volkswagen uh packed to the gills of probably 13 players and you think about it now oh my goodness uh but it was just a laugh I can't. I, I used to look forward to it so much. It was the fun and the laughter and the banter. Jackie gave it out. He took it. Player, if you if you didn't have thick skin, getting in that car, or or you were you were murdered. You're absolutely murdered. And you had to be able to take it. You had to take it on the chin, and you had to give it back. And that was part of the resilience. And people talk about that now, but that that was the backbone of. Uh, the, the traits that actually enabled me to go on and have a career in the game, believe it or not. But that was the start of it, and I didn't know it at the time, but certainly when I look back now, it's it was the start of something that really enabled me to go on and have a career. But Jackie was a tremendous influence on my life, and in particular when I, when I signed for Liverpool. It was, I think it was one of his proudest moments. Brilliant, brilliant, and and the thing is, we're gonna you know we're gonna touch on all the through the careers, even though we've only got about forty five minutes, we're gonna hear for be here for about four days. But Phil, we're talking about Jackie Maxwell, mm. the guy who started St. Oliver Plunkett, sort of influenced thousands and thousands of kids all over West Belfast, Belfast and beyond. Give us some sort of an idea of the man or your time at St. Oliver Plunkett before you even went across yeah. to Manchester United. Like, let's forget about that for the time being. Just what was the, like mm. your experience of going and playing in them? Like, I, the same as Jim there, in a sense, we're going to probably say the same things about his character, but, like, as, as any great manager, say, if you look at Premier League managers and so forth, like, they're not just concerned about your football ability, as Jim's saying, they're on the pitch. Like, you had this real sense that, that Jackie really loved you or cared for, your, cared for your life, what you were going to do with the rest of your life, what kind of man you were going to become, you know, what kind of values you were going to have. You know, would you be someone you'd be proud of? You know, it was about instilling character, and this is what it meant to be to play for Plunkett. It wasn't just that we're all gathered together and we're going away on a Saturday to play. This is what it means to play for for Plunkett. The certain kind of uh, way you behave and, and, and so forth, and you had this real sense that he, he really cared about you. You know, and like all great managers, if you have that sense with someone, you want to give them everything. And Jackie's enthusiasm and his love for the game and his going mental on the sideline like during the match, you know, 
all those things like as Jim talking about there breeds that kind of like resilience and you want to do your you, you want to die for money you, you want to do your best on that pitch room and and for the fellas you're playing with because these are the, the same groups of, of men that you're going to you, you you socialize with your mates and you're looking forward to this game all week i remember like friday nights just couldn't just like just going to bed just couldn't wait for to get up and to get on that bus to go for the games you know but that that's what i would say about jackie really for me personally kind of just that sense of like you really had this sense that he he cared for you completely your whole life and your your family life how you were doing off the pitch uh, to make sure that you would you would you would achieve your goals but but you would, you would become a good man you know someone your parents would be proud of and someone that the club would be proud of to say that you were part of you know brilliant and uh, this is where we start thinking okay we've now kind of got to a stage where we're all kind of 16 jim's going across to liverpool you were about to go and join manchester united what was the kind of the thought process as you got on that boat or on that plane to get across to join pretty much the two biggest clubs in england what were you going what did you think it was the first airplane i'd ever gotten on that was the first thing i thought oh my goodness i'm getting stepping onto an airplane and i know it was i i know i paved the way for you two and i know i'm your hero and all that sort of thing and <laughs> I was. I think it was. I was Anton. I think it was Anton Rogan. But anyway. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Definitely. Me. It was Mal you know, I, It was Mal I remember, for me. I remember both you, little toddlers, <laughs> running around. Now. There's Jimmy Field, and I remember all that. You know? So, uh, listen, it was, it was. It was surreal. It, honestly, it was one week watching match a day, watching Liverpool, and the next week picking up their dirty kit. And and the Hansons, this world, the Grabbelars, the Steve Nichols, going into that environment. And let's be honest, we were at St. Oliver Plunkett and we didn't lose many games. I'd always come in from a, a winning mentality. I joined uh, De Silva and again in a winning winning team. To, to go into that mentality as well, I, I witnessed firsthand that uh, the mentality every single day of top professionals coming in and playing with such intensity. Everyone talked about what was the secret. The secret was hard work. And it was every day. First thing a coach said to me, be better than you were the day before. And that just resonated with me. It stayed with me through my whole career. It was something I spoke spoke inwardly to myself every single day. Mm. I walked in the train at whatever club I was at. So going into Liverpool, Liverpool were winning league titles. It was Kenny's first year, player manager. Going to Wembley was second nature to me. You know, having watched it every cup final uh, from birth, basically, to go there. It was just part of the course. And that Liverpool Foundation apprenticeship, if you like, was something that gave me uh, the, 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 the foundations to go on and have a career in the game. I learned so much. Amazing. Um, I should just say at this point, if anyone is joining us on Twitter, Facebook or YouTube, um, I'm here with Father Philip Moran and also Jim McGilton. And we're just trying to raise a little bit of money for the wonderful work the NHS are doing. So if you would like to donate, please just go on the Just Given website, type in McVeigh Meets and donate whatever you can. That'll be really, really appreciated. So, Phil, Jim's talking about going over to Liverpool and that you know iconic team of Liverpool in the 80s, Kenny Douglas, in Rush and all the rest of it. But then when you're going across to Manchester United, you're, you're joining the Premier League champions with Alex Ferguson, Brian Robson, Roy Keane, all of those guys. So what was that like? Um, probably, the, you know, I, I would say Jim has a, a natural kind of confidence, you know, in his ability, kind of in his personality. Like, but for me, I don't know, maybe like for yourself, Paul, as well, like sometimes we can have this inferiority complex that we, OK, we might have the ability, but going across to England, am I really good enough? And um, and I know one big thing for me, for me was the physical side of things because um, I was quite small and thin and kind of the one thing I noticed when I got to Manchester and I went out the first day in for a training session was how physically bigger and quicker and stronger a lot of the players were from England, you know, and that takes a little while to get over to find your place. Um, but the one thing I remember is, like Jim said there, the, the training sessions and the relentless nature of the um, of the training and the games and the pressure that they put on put you under even as a 16 year old and going back to Jackie there in Plunkett I think those traits um, of, of responding to criticism and as a young fella and being able to deal with say Jackie and Marty especially for ourselves kind of was good for us because when I got to United 16 year old the managers were on your case about standards in the game 
And I remember coming in after a game once and them saying this, if you can't deal with the pressure here, we're, we're, we're consciously putting you under that pressure here in these games because you're going to have to walk out in front of 75,000 people. And how will you fold uh, in that environment? And so they, they're kind of sculpting that already and seeing who's mentally strong. You know, but so after about six months of being in the youth team, I started to kind of look get a little bit bigger, but I started to play well and, you know, and confidence kind of grew and I felt, no, I belong here. You know, no, I have the ability to, to, to make it here uh, as far as I can, you know, and then with the feedback of coaches as well. But um, at this stage, we weren't training with the first team at anything, but we were just interacting with them on a daily basis. And like these guys I had on my wall, you know, uh, Ryan Giggs and Eric Cantona, you know, and it was just to be in the changing room or walking into the changing room after they've came in to grab their boots and clean them and, you know, just listening, actually just staying there, listening to their conversations. And it was just surreal and unbelievable. Um, but I have to say on a very personal level, certainly at Man United, the, the players, the first team players that I encountered at the time, even if you say the class of 92 who came through, they were all like, because they'd came through as youth team players, they were really, really good with us and always like asking you about how you're getting on and trying to help you in any way you could. So it was just an amazing time to be there with the quality of the players and with the success that they were having. And this is really interesting whenever I'm speaking to loads of different people, you know, over the last week or so, and it's all generally people who, you know, I consider to be the most successful, has profile. And there's one theme that keeps coming out time after time in every single one of these interviews or chats that we're having, and it's all around leadership. So. Jim, let me start with you. Whenever you talk about going into Liverpool, what kind of lessons very early on did you get around leadership and leading people? Uh, it was constant every day, Paul, every day. Um, I, think, I think that when I watched them train, top-class players train, it was the mentality to win first and foremost. It was their obsession with being better. Even, at, even when they came to Liverpool, they were obsessed with being better because they knew two or three games, they're out, of the, they're out of the team. And to get back into the team could take a long time. So it was that, there was that doggy dog scenario. And Phil's right, when you go over, you do see this size thing. At Liverpool, it was all about training well, bringing training into the game scenario. Practice, practice, practice. And it was this consistency in the message. That consistency in the message drove you on. You knew that if you trained well and started to play well, you, you, even at big clubs, you do get noticed. Now, there are, the moment came when I couldn't, couldn't break into the first team and had to go. But it went with our blessing. And I watched, I watched quiet leaders. You know, there were quiet boys in the dressing room. Mark Lawrence wasn't the most vocal, but you could tell, say that he, he had great leadership uh, qualities on the pitch. So... Uh, there were just classic examples of that. And then when I was handed the armband at Liverpool to, to, to lead out the reserves, they obviously seen something in me that maybe I hadn't really recognised. And, um, and there was an inner confidence in me and an inner, um, an inner steel that I wanted to succeed. And again, I was obsessed with the game, obsessed with trying to be better. Knew my strengths, recognised my weaknesses, but built on my strengths. So... Uh, from a very early age, they identified that, and significantly, significantly, I went on to uh, captain every club and eventually captain Northern Ireland, and eventually went into management. So, I think they they recognised that in, at an early age. Yeah, it's interesting in the field because um, whenever we talk about Jim's weaknesses in the, in the game, we could probably you know we could start listing them, could we? Track them back. Uh, <laughs> trying, <laughs> trying to build up your teammates, not shouting at them, uh, <laughs> scoring goals. I've, I've got Eat, quite, a, quite a big list there. <laughs> eat, eating the ball, no, as Jackie was said. Eating the ball. <laughs> the ball never sweats. The ball never ever sweats. <laughs> it was so funny because I remember whenever we first joined into the, the Northern Ireland team and getting into that squad because Phil had already broken in and you know and, and was like almost like the blue eyed boy coming through. And I just remember coming into that Northern Ireland squad with like you, Jim, Ian Dowie, you know, Neil Lennon, Steve Lomas, Jerry Taggart, and just like pfft, just thinking, <laughs> how do you stand up these lads? Because it was just a hundred mile an hour getting shouted at or getting blasted about something. And it's like you say, you just have to have the thickest skin possible. 
and you did. (laughs) 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 Right, anyway, moving on from that, Phil, Tell, talk to me about Sir Alex Ferguson because you obviously had a, a good relationship and, and Jim said about, you know, probably like we all had that experience, you know, got in close to the first team, didn't quite make it at a first club and then needed to move on. But mm. you had a, like a really special relationship with the manager, didn't you? Yeah, like he, like I suppose like many top managers, like he would be watching like the youth teams all the time. He'd be at, at all the matches watching you at the cliff there from his office up above you know and um coming in and encouraging you and coming in and criticizing when he needed to um and then when i got into the kind of the reserves say you start to come to his attention a little bit more and you have started to have one-on-one conversations with him and and you know he really again like talking about what i said earlier on he was completely concerned about every aspect of your life so how are you getting on in your digs how's your family from home know, knew the names of your parents um, all these little details, making sure that you were happy off the pitch, um, all these different things, and then bringing you slowly into the first team squad. Um, and then I suppose when you're talking about leaders there, like, you know, certainly it was Brian Kidd uh, and the manager who would have been coaching on a daily basis, but Brian Kidd really taking the, the, the sessions um, uh, and him just standing back and watching. Because like Jim said there, when you have players at that level, they're basically coaching themselves because the likes of Gary Neville, um, and Roy Keane, obviously, at the time, Steve Bruce, Gary Pallister, Peter Schmeichel, you know, in a training session, these guys are verbally leading things and demanding off each other and then on each other's back to the point where the manager really doesn't have to come in and say anything. They're, they're, they're basically giving team talks themselves because they're so self-motivated uh, to be there. So you have different types of leadership, I would say. Gary Neville, even though he was verbal as well, but led by example out there with Phil Neville out there half an hour before training every day, warming up, practicing. Eric Cantona staying, David Beckham staying in the afternoons when people had gone home, coming in to the reserve team changing room or the youth team changing room, asking for a couple of players to come out and just kick balls at them and help them, you know, in the afternoon. You'd see these things and, and starts to shape you. This is what it takes. If you're, if the sheer tenacity and single-mindedness of what it means to succeed here. Um, but I have to say, my dealings with, with Alex Ferguson were, were wonderful. And even when I left, you know, around my move to Norwich and stuff, and um, I think if I remember back correctly, he offered me a new contract to stay um, if I wanted to stay. Um, but the decision was mine, you know. And when I realized I, I, couldn't, I wasn't going to break through with the talent they had in midfield, I decided to go. But nevertheless, you know, uh, that was on the table. And then just finally, just one kind of story, which was amazing. Um, six months after I left, um, I broke my leg in my second game for Norwich uh, at the time. And one of the first phone calls I had in hospital was Alex Ferguson. And I think he even asked, I remember he, he said to, to Norwich at the time, if I wanted to return to Manchester and do all my rehabilitation at Man United because of the facilities, that that was on the table as well. So it was those little things, like even after I'd left, he was still watching out for, for players who used to be there, you know. Yeah, no, and I remember you telling that story, and and that kind of for me, almost put the other side of you see what Ferguson was like as a manager, and you see him on match of the day, etc. But when I remember you telling me that story and thinking he just really cares about his players, and it doesn't matter if you've had him for a year, two years, mm-hmm. they're his players for life, and probably goes back to what we're saying about Jackie Maxwell. So then let's go through the rest of the time because obviously, Jim, if we had to talk about your story all day long would probably send everybody to sleep but so <laughs> in terms <laughs> in terms of going through the rest of your career what stage did you think okay i'm not making a liverpool but i still want to go on and have like a top class career because you played over 500 games around the premier league yeah it was they made my mind up pretty quickly i was playing in the reserves playing out of my skin and uh kenny just brought me in and and one afternoon i'm thinking he, he wants to speak to me. I'm, I'm actually thinking that I'm going to make my debut. Uh, and I'm thinking, how am I going to contact my parents? How am I going to contact uh, my mates to get them over for the game? And lo and behold, it was actually the opposite. My Liverpool career came to an abrupt end. Uh, he told me uh, that Oxford United had made a bid and that, uh, that the club had accepted it and it was time to move on. So that was uh, that, that, the emotional roller coaster of football hit home there and then and 
I was completely devastated. I didn't even know where Oxford was. Kenny actually had to get a map out to tell me, and I actually mapped out my journey to Oxford, and uh, and off I went. But I, I remember crying from Liverpool to Oxford, and then I remember just again this inner steel. I think it was probably my upbringing, and then and parents, and uh, and my family background, and also my football background, my plunket enabled me to you know brush it off and say, right, this is the start of my life. This I've wanted to be a professional footballer all my life. So quit your gurning as your parents would say, and <laughs> off, off you go. So again, I had a manager, I was very lucky, I had managers who had great faith in me. I was an acquired taste, as you know, chaps. So uh, the, the managers that picked me, selected me, were for obvious my strengths, but also probably around this uh, leadership qualities that I had. And again, it was really, this was only starting to happen. I mean, within a year, I was captain of Oxford. Then I went on to, uh, Southampton, I eventually became captain there, and then I went on to Ipswich, or Sheffield Wednesday, I was captain there as soon as I came into the door. Then I went to Ipswich, eventually captain there, and then managed. So, um, listen, I had a fantastic time, again, a fantastic time with quality players, the camaraderie that was built up at every football club, the friendships you remember, the times you remember, the times we all shared it with Northern Ireland were fantastic. And you travel the world. The game has given me so much, and uh, and that's probably why I'm still in it, trying to give it back to young players here in Northern Ireland. But no, listen, it was just the fantastic times and the opportunities to play at the highest level were standouts for me. There weren't any special moments. Of course, you go through little bits and pieces, but the whole journey was special. It is special, and it's about cherishing those moments. Yeah, and, and I think that's what probably we could all say is that, that most of the best memories probably aren't even on the football pitch. You know, sometimes it might be on the training pitch. It could be just going for a meal or a night out, whatever it is. And Phil, I probably would put um, myself and you in the same category in terms of having a slightly more kind of up and down career compared to Jim, who probably had much more of a mm -hmm. sustained top level career. But ours was more of a roller coaster. What would you kind of look back yeah. on yours like? Yeah, I suppose like when uh, when I look back at my career, I look mostly to Norwich, you know, because like, okay, played a handful of games in the first team at United, but you still didn't feel uh, absolutely a part of it, you know, a part of the team because you're on the fringes and you're turning up on a Saturday and you don't know if your name's going to be in the squad and, and so forth. But when, when I went to Norwich, it was the first time, uh, unlike Jim there in the sense of, it's kind of looking forward uh, to leaving United at that stage and wanting to actually start playing so my, I remember that drive to Norwich in a very different way kind of like so excited um, and again kind of knew knew a little bit about the club and knew that that some decent players like Craig Bellamy and stuff there at the time and and I, I remember the first training session just really feeling at home had the sense that this was a real family club and uh, and and again you'd, you'd someone like Craig Bellamy as Paul as you know who was on your case and training as well so he was demanding kind of standards and and I thought okay this is you know, we could do something here, and 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 uh, I could see myself staying here for quite a number of years. And that time was amazing. Those five years that I had there, like we went, we obviously uh, got to the playoff final, then got got promoted, and then got relegated, and so forth. But um, all my memories, really positive memories, are there. That whole journey with that team, and and how it kind of evolved over time, especially when Nigel came in and took over the success that we had. In those couple of years, and and, the, and that especially that season where we got to the playoff final and then won the league, the uh, with the likes of Peter Crouch and Darren Hockerby and stuff coming in, just that 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 team spirit we had that year was just amazing on the pitch and off the pitch, and so most of my memories come from that period. You know, later on, obviously, um, I think with my broken leg, the effects that I had after that had an effect on on my game without me really knowing it. Um, lost a bit of pace, which I wasn't really. I would say the quickest anyway. So I lost again, I lost a bit of pace through that. And I started getting hamstring injuries and a lot of injuries around my core because my back was weak from the broken leg of a little bit of arthritis. And so towards the end of the year, end of my career, kind of really, you can remember that, you know, trying taking medication just to get through training and, and get through the games and so forth. But just so reluctant to, to take that step, you know, to come to an end and just trying to stay in the game as long as possible. And, you know, listen, at the end of the day, you know, at, at 12, uh, 12 years, you know, uh, in, in the game, maybe about eight years 
um, with the reserves and then the first team and so forth. So I'm, I'm full of gratitude for it, like Jim there, you know, uh, an amazing journey, really. And, and I suppose that was probably then, as you were having more injuries, having a few more issues at the end of your days of playing, it probably might have made it a slightly easier decision to come out of professional football. But Jim, you were pretty yeah. much still playing at the very, very top level all the way through until you just decided to stop playing yourself. So what was that like? Tough. Uh, but the decision was made for me basically on, on the back of uh, going for a job interview. I was at the very club I'd spent seven years. So so coming out of professional, I've been 16, coming up to 37, I've done pretty well. And Mulvane said he was quick as a joke. Uh, so I, never <laughs> had that. I said I wasn't <laughs> quick. Uh, no, no, you didn't quick. Uh, so, so it was then kind of like made for me. And I trust, I went straight into managing. And in and no other industry do you get that opportunity, I don't think. You know, I, I didn't have the tools. I was still... I was taking uh, my B license. I was uh, about to go on my A license, and then I was thrust into the job. So, so I didn't have time to think, uh, and I didn't have time to reminisce or any back slapping and saying, "Oh, well done, Jim, and you've done this and you've done that." It wasn't. It was straight in. I was putting everything on the table. So, my reputation as a player was really going to pot because I was going to be judged now as a manager. And those three and a half years, uh, three years at the club, were fantastic, great. Again, apprenticeship in the managing, and then uh, the six months of QPR taught me invaluable lessons. And from that, I've remained in the game. I had a little bit of time out, family um, uh, pro problems, family uh, parents, and whatever. And uh, and I've been in a job now for five and a half years, developing a youth program here in Northern Ireland, developing coach education here in Northern Ireland, and being around UEFA and, and all the top people at UEFA. And it's just been tremendous. I'm so lucky. Uh, to be still in the game. And it's interesting you say that about how you've gone straight into management and the lessons that you would have had from management and you've been around the world, you've been to Melbourne, who, by the way, my mate Darren Davis from Spurs says that you haven't accepted his friend request on Facebook, so make sure you do that. But it's like all of these, all of these <laughs> lessons... <laughs> <laughs> but you know all these lessons that you suddenly got from management like that must have been a a whirlwind and b such a steep learning curve so so can you give us some idea because i've never managed anyone i only just had to look after myself as a player so what did you really learn about yourself and, and about leading others it was about time management time management was crucial in it and it was about delegation uh you know there were i tried Firstly, I try to do everything, and I was incapable of doing it. And you know, your only concentration should be on the players and the players' performances. I tried to do everything. I was trying to go to budget meetings. I was trying to do board meetings. I was trying to do medical team, everything, the scouting network, everything. And I had my own ideas. Twenty years in the game around top coaches, top managers enabled me to have a a foundation. You know, I had my own ideas, and I'm pretty strong-willed. And, uh, and I wanted to implement that pro probably too quickly. But in the end, you know, uh, I found that delegation was key and managing my time was especially important. Uh, and, uh, and three and a half years into the job, four years into the job, uh, working with Megal at Grovers enabled me to be more relaxed in that situation. I felt very much at home. I, I, I enjoyed the pressure cooker situation. Three o'clock on a Saturday wasn't a problem to me. It was the other bits and pieces. I think the players found it more difficult than I did because I'd compare myself mentally to go into that. That was the next stage for me. But I, as you know, pretty much a social captain. I enjoyed uh, the social part of it and was very much in the in, in the heart of all that. So players found that distance uh, very difficult at first, but then they then they got used to it. Uh, but yeah, I feel feel and do feel very relaxed in that environment. Still do. Yeah, no, I know, and definitely uh, I would agree with all of those things you said. And Phil, we won't talk about too much about the social stuff that we had over the years and, and maybe more talk about your uh, your journey in a second. But if anyone is joining us again, then please realise that we're only doing these interviews just to try and raise a little bit of money for the NHS because of the wonderful job they're doing in the fight against COVID-19. So if you would like to donate, you can go on the NMS social media profiles 
and my link to my fundraising page is on there or just go on just giving and type in McVeigh Mates and donate on there. So Phil, you're obviously sitting there in your vestments, in your robes, in Dublin after playing for Manchester United, Norwich City, Cardiff, Northern Ireland. Bit of a bit of a step in a in a in an unusual direction for a Premier League footballer. You're not wrong. Yeah, um, and it's it's something. <laughs> I don't know how you start that an answer to that, but. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I suppose, like, okay, fundamentally, it's kind of a journey of, okay, of, of where you're going to find happiness in life. And I started, I think, towards the end of my career, and uh, you'll remember this, Paul, like, okay, we can touch on the kind of social things, kind of enjoying life a little bit too much off the pitch, you know, um, to the detriment of my career, you know. And, uh, and there's reasons for that, I think. You're trying to fill... You're trying to fill a, uh, an emptiness, or trying to. You're, it's not just for the sake of it. There's something, you know. I didn't like to be alone, and I like to be out with the fellas all the time, and so forth. And then when I got to my late my late twenties, twenty eight, twenty nine, I think I started to ask some really deeper questions, and kind of like, okay, not so much what am I just going to do after the game, but like, okay, more deeper than that. And it led me on a bit of a journey, and I started to read, you know, which I wasn't a big reader in my early twenties, and I started to read books, and I started to. I had family members, my sister especially, who was kind of a, a very devout kind of woman who would be phoning me all the time. And even though we had our Catholic faith growing up in Belfast, you know, um, it was part of your identity. It maybe wasn't deeply rooted, um, but at least it was there for some sense to be able to return to it. But when I, take, when I took uh, a few months out of the game to come back to Belfast and then to kind of reassess okay, and, and, and possibly with going back to play maybe for a couple of more years, um, it was really there that everything changed. I kind of volunteered in, in a, with the Legion of Mary in a homeless shelter, and, and my sister brought me to a prayer group, and and, and I just started to not, notice going to mass again. I had this deep, deep contentment, and like I'd never experienced before. That kind of restlessness that I had as a footballer was like ended. You know the highs and lows, and this restless that nothing was ever enough. Um, and here I was, all of a sudden, for the first time. When I was praying, when I was reading, when I was doing this kind of work, I felt really as if I was as if there was a part of me that this I was made for this. And after six months of that, it was really uh, I just started to feel this draw and this desire to be a priest from nowhere. And I never thought about that in my life. And and you guys can listen. We can joke about that. You guys could say that I was probably the most unlikeliest character. Uh, possibly to, to turn out to be a priest no, um, but that, that was a con that was a confirmation for me as well because I knew this wasn't something that would come from me you know it's something coming yeah. from elsewhere um, asking me to do this for my own good as well you know uh, and so I just said yes to that call and took the took the practical step of, of 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 the journey and then once I entered the seminary to study to be a priest I loved every minute of it and just each each year just went to the next to the next till finally I was ordained in 2017. Yeah, and that, and that was a really amazing time whenever I remember going over mm. to the Ireland at the time I was still living in England and going over to see you being ordained and that was just like such a momentous day and and Jim you know when we were there you just thinking this this is amazing what what was you thinking Jim whenever you seen that the sort of journey and the path that Phil was going on since coming out of football. I thought he. I thought it was fancy dressed. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say though, uh, when, when Phil, <laughs> when Phil, uh, his first mass at our parish, I, I, I it was so emotional. It was one of the. It was one of the finest moments. Uh, it was one of them surreal, again surreal moments. I'm looking at a boy the man and his journey. I was so emotional that night. I was so proud of him. It was in incredible. This this boy uh, is standing up and he, he spoke so eloquently. He spoke so articulately. Uh, and I can't even say that. Uh, that it, it was an amazing experience for me. It was an, a truly amazing experience. We were surrounded by friends, surrounded by loads of people in the, in the, in the, in the chapel that night, most of them women. Uh, but uh, we left window. <laughs> but it was, no, it was just I. I loved him, Jack. I was so proud of him. Honestly, yeah. I was so proud. And yeah. I, it was a special, 
special name. And, and Phil, a Phil, I don't think what people might not realise, you know, if you're not <laughs> either, if you're not a Catholic, if you've never been around the kind of anything to do with religion or religious people. But, you know, I was just explaining it today that actually for you to enter the priesthood, you actually have to take three vows. So can mm -hmm. you just sort of elaborate on that? Well, you've, you, you've kind of two, two, two ways of being a priest. You know, you've your parish priest in a diocese in a parish church. And, um, and he would take a vow of celibacy, which basically renouncing the possibility of marriage, you know. Um, but also, um, and also, but I'm a part of a religious order um, called the Dominican Order. And we, uh, we take two extra vows. So you take a vow of celibacy again, you know, that, you know, this renouncing the beautiful good, which is marriage. But also you take two vows of poverty and obedience and which a normal uh, diocesan priest doesn't take a vow of poverty. And basically what that means is six months before your ordination or your final vows, you have to uh, make up a will and hand over everything you own uh, to someone of your own choosing, you know, um, either your family or, or even the order itself. You have to divest yourself of everything um, to the point that you can't even have access to a bank account and so forth. You have to rely on the, on the community that each brother is the same and you rely on the generosity of the people who come to the church, you know? Um, so these were, I don't know, there's something that really appealed to my, my, my nature. And again, it's probably this kind of, about growing up where we grew up, this, self, this sense of like self-sacrifice and there's something heroic and sacrificing yourself for something greater, you know? And, and, and you do that as well in football to a certain extent, you know, for the team. So there was something inbuilt in me that an attraction towards this radical way of life. You know, here you have a renunci renunciation of these beautiful things um, for something greater than yourself. And that really appealed to me. And it, listen, at the end of the day, we have to be honest, it's not without its challenges. Um, but again, with God's grace and with your prayer life, um, I th I, I've really came to value that vow of celibacy. It's something beautiful and something that the priest does uh, not so much for himself, but for, for his ministry and for the people that he's supposed to be serving so that he's free um, uh, to serve and be completely, exist completely for them. You know, so it's something quite beautiful that even though the world might see it in a different light and people without faith might not understand it, but it's something I came to really value. And, and I think one of the other things that maybe people might not fully understand is the, the level of, well, obviously you've talked about all that commitment, but also the level of study and what you need to do just to try and reach that level of, of you know, going through all these degrees and all this consistent and constant education of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So you've, you've, the, you've the two sides of your spiritual formation. That's obvious. That's your, your interior life, your prayer life and your relationship with God. And because ultimately that's what nourishes you. You can't stay in the vocation unless you have a strong prayer life. It doesn't make sense unless that's alive. Um, but also on a practical level, you, it's the whole education program, as you say, you, you need, a, you need a, a degree in philosophy, you need a degree, a degree in theology, uh, which takes four years. And then you need, then you, the church asks you to do ancient languages. So you have to do Greek and Latin. Now, not to the point where you become proficient and like uh, conversant in these languages, but that you're able to, to look at a passage and translate especially for translation and then as part of the Dominican order because we're a worldwide order um, the three official languages of the order are Spanish French and English and the master of the order who, who's in Rome wa wants every brother to know at least two of the three languages so again on top of those ancient languages we do French or Spanish um, and so yeah so that was something I was very worried about going into it would I be able for the for the for the uh, academic side of things because unlike you and Jim I didn't go to a grammar school as Jim pointed out uh, there you know but with a bit of help uh, and, uh, and some tutors in the first few years like I was able to kind of uh, to kind of actually when you come back as a mature student you'll kind of know this yourself if you have the motivation you know you you, you have capacities you probably didn't even realize so it was fine yeah and amazing and you're, you're only talking about you know french or spanish and i yet i remember going over to visit you in the irish college in rome and i think you're that's about only about 500 meters from the coliseum and i actually think i am proficient in italian because i've studied it and just naturally picked it up over the years and once we were going on the metro and i went over to ask directions and then you come over and you started speaking fluent italian and i'm thinking 
How many more languages do you know here? So it's it's, it's amazing to see the difference. Considering when we were playing, you could barely spell rhythm as Malcolm McKay <laughs> used to test you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true that's so true i know we actually we, 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 we actually had a we actually had a quiz you know in the lockdown here with the brothers we had a we had a quiz and i had a, there, was a, there was a spelling round so i did that spell rhythm you know that came, that came back in my mind <laughs> yeah amazing big malky big malky would be loving that right now guys listen i'm not going to keep you any longer it's been it's been absolutely fascinating i wish we could be doing this uh in a pub over a pint of Guinness that would be much more uh, preferable but unfortunately uh, this is going to have to do for now <laughs> but uh, yeah uh, in fact Jim you actually look like a pint of Guinness sitting there to be honest like with that grey hair that's kicking in now <laughs> so, yeah, but listen Absolutely. thanks very much on, Jimmy. thanks very much for having us brilliant good man really, thank you really, really. good man Jim good, good to see you see you son and you brother <laughs> and if anyone else wants to join me tomorrow, I'm going to be here with Rory Best at 1pm British Standard Time. And hopefully I might have a sensible conversation with him. Take care and stay safe.